Greetings and welcome back to Room 303. In our talks with Walt, as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, we turn now to a little poem, The Last Invocation, poem number 16 of the 18, of Whispers of Heavenly Death. This superb lyrical skill here that's uh, that's being uh, represented, often set to music, as our Nortons will tell us in a little bit. Now, Whitman's readers would immediately make connections that we today might not make with a, a title like this, The Last Invocation. Notice this is not the first line of the poem. This is just simply its title. Obviously, The Last Supper immediately comes to mind for many of Whitman's readers, as well as this notion of the invocation of the muse. In other words, here, Whitman paying homage to his Homer and his Virgil. No question about that. Now, our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, Talks with Waldar playlist, and that you've been with us from the very first of the invocation words come, all the way up to and including a set of comments that are introdu introducing Whispers of Heavenly Death, the cluster. And then we just finished with that amazing little poem, Thought. Now we'll turn to our Nortons to be told that this was the fourth of the five numbered poems first printed in the London Broadway magazine, October 1868. You'll remember we commented on this when we, um, when we saw the poem, Whispers of Heavenly Death itself. Next, it appeared in the present group in the 1871 Passage to India. It was reprinted in Leaves of Grass 1872, in two rivulets of 1876, and finally unaltered in 1881. And now Nortons will tell us of superb lyrical skill. It has often been set to music by modern composers, among them Frank Bridge, 1919, Percival Garrett, 1920, James H. Rogers, 1919. In the words of John Livingston Lowe's Convention and Revolt in Poetry uh, of 1919, the reader who will, quote, let the words beat their own time, end quote, may find the clue to Whitman's practice of constructing stanzas on the basis of repetitive, actuential patterns of rhythm. We'll, we'll um, try and see if we can hear some of this in this amazing little poem, The Last Invocation. At the last, tenderly, from the walls of the powerful fortress house, from the clasp of the knotted locks, from the keep of the well-closed doors, let me be wafted. Let me glide noiselessly forth, with the key of softness unlock the locks, with a whisper set open the doors, O soul. Tenderly, be not impatient, strong as your hold, O mortal flesh, Strong as your hold, O oh, love. The rhythms here are brilliant. From the walls of powerful fortress house, from the clasp of the knitted locks, from the keep of the well-closed doors, let me be wafted. Notice this just punctuating and then ending with, with, with the let me be wafted. Let's go through it now and just exegete. It's, it's brilliant. By the way, the last, you'll, of course, me immediately think of when lilacs last in the dooryard bloom, that amazing poem of the celebration of Lincoln, the, the, the lugubrious nature of, of Lincoln's assassination. And invocation is only used one other time in Leaves of Grass. We'll see it later in uh, Starry Night. It's the very first poem in Starry Night, uh, Thou, uh, Thou Orb uh, uh, Aloft um, Full Dazzling. We'll see it only one other time, the invocation used. However, as we've commented so many times in our study, clearly Whitman is trying to invoke the muse so many times in Leaves of Grass. Here, it's the last invocation. And notice, it begins with the word at, and the phrase, the last. Now, you'll, you'll remember this in, in uh, Song of Myself 37, the last gasp. Here, tenderly gets used, which obviously takes us to Song of Myself, passage 6. Tenderly will I use you, curling grass. And then we're going to get three frums, from the walls of the powerful fortress house, okay, obviously here we can be speaking of the human body, from the clasp, I told you guys about hugging, of the knitted locks, I told you about these, this word picture of grabbing, hugging, clasping, from the keep of the well-closed doors. Now our Nortons will tell us about this word keep, this archaic noun refers to the deep underground vaults of a dungeon or a castle, this is what he means, although obviously the word keep plays its to, to hold, right, keep, of the well-closed doors. From all of that, let me be wafted 
14 times in Leaves of Grass, this word gets used. Of course, that makes sense because grass and growing and smelling, the power of smelling. Then we're to the next let me. Let me glide. Five times in Leaves of Grass, this word gets used. Noiselessly, uh, no, noiseless patient spider comes to mind. Four. In other words, there's going to be this sense in, uh, in, in like it's, it's uh, this idea of gliding and warble for lilac time. That is to say the journey. And here's his tribute, obviously, to Homer in the Odyssey, right? Let me glide noiselessly forth with the key of softness unlock the locks. By the word, the use of the word key can be both that which unlocks as well as key is a musical term, isn't it? With the key of softness unlock the locks. Um, you, you remember in Song of Myself 48 that he says there's no object so soft but it becomes a hub for the will universe? I, guys, I've said this to you. I think Whitman is having a great time writing these poems and putting them in the order that they finally end up for the deathbed edition. And then he says it with a whisper. This idea of whispering. We've seen this so many times in Leaves of Grass. Set oak the doors. You, um, you'll remember that oak here. Is, is used by Blue Ontario Shores, Passage 11. You'll remember the cannons ope their muzzles. Um, it's the only other use of this word, ope, although obviously open is a very popular word, song of the open road in the line. Ope the doors, and now we're going to have three of these O's. O, soul. Um, in other words, now we're speaking again to the soul. And then we're back to tenderly. The, the beauty of coming back to that word the dash again, reminding us. This poem reminds a lot of readers of Emily Dickinson, doesn't it? Be not impatient, to speaking now to the soul. Be not impatient. In other words, we're back to the idea of learning to wait, as we commented in an earlier poem. And then in parenthetics, strong is your hold, O mortal flesh. Strong is your hold, O love, in parenthetics. Think about the power that he speaks both to the flesh as well as to love, the soul. In other words, we're back to Song of Myself 48. I have said that the soul is not more than the body, and I said that the body is not more than the soul, and nothing, not God, is greater to one than oneself is. We're back to this brilliant, brilliant idea. Well, what are we going to make of a poem like this at 2A in Messages? I think that we've said this before, and I think we learned this idea from our Whitman, that at the moment of death, all humans speak the same words. The words are, oh my God. The only question is the inflection of the voice. That is to say, most of us at the moment of death are, oh my God, what have I done with my life? No, no, no. We think of Scrooge and the Christmas Carol. That comes to mind. But there are, and I think Whitman was hoping for this for himself and for readers of Leaves of Grass, there are people who are ready to go ahead and see death tenderly, not in a frightening way, and to say the words, oh my God, but the inflection of the voice is different. In other words, love, I'm ready, I'm ready to go. We think obviously of Plato and the Phaedo as Socrates is ready to drink his hemlock shake. At 2 be, I love the use of the word tenderly. I love the word choice of clasp and knitted, this idea of we have this tendency to want to hold on to life, but there is this thing called the soul and there is love and to that degree, we mustn't, we mustn't see this process as anything other than tenderly. And obviously, it takes us back to Song of Myself, Passage 6. Tenderly will I use you. You'll remember this word luckier is how that poem ends. It's quite compelling. At 3A, that's, that's the best, I mean, that's the best way, I think, to read this poem, is to go back and look at passage number 6. Because we have a few seconds. I just love... To, uh, to go back and take a look at it again, just to hear it one more time, because it's so brilliant. He says it, what do you think, notice more rhetorical questions, what do you think has become of the young and old men? And what do you think has become of the women and children? They are alive and well somewhere. The smallest sprout shows there is really no death. And if ever there was, it led forward life and does not wait at the end to arrest it and ceased the moment life appeared. All goes onward and outward, and nothing collapses. And to die is different from what anyone supposed, and luckier. Finally, at 3B, how are we going to own a little poem like this? This is the reason why I, I have suggested you have to read all the poems of Leaves of Grass, because there's little gems like this hidden away. What do you think happens to you when you die? 
I think a poem like this certainly leads us to think about that as the last invocation. And what will you hold on to, to use the language of this poem, what will you hold on to at the moment of your passing? What will be the inflection of your voice as you pass? And to what degree is reading Leaves of Grass helping you prepare for that moment? I hope that that's happening. Thank you.